Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. The name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Most Merciful. I'd like to welcome you, dear viewers, to another in our series, Understanding the Quran. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May Allah's peace and blessings be on each and every one of you. We continue in our series looking at the chapter, the 57th chapter of the Quran, Surah Al Hadid, known as the chapter of iron. And in our previous episode, we were looking at verse 8. We didn't complete the discussion. In verse 8, Allah says there, If you are truly believers, why do you not believe in Allah when the messenger invites you to believe in your Lord and he has taken your covenant? Now, we looked at the concept of believing in the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu believing in Allah when the revelation was amongst them. And there was a particular statement of the Prophet Sallallahu where he on one occasion had said, to his companions, what do you consider among believers, or who do you consider among believers as having the most amazing faith? And the companions had said, the angels. And then the Prophet ﷺ had said, but what prevents them from believing when they're with their Lord? Then they said, the prophets. And then he said, what prevents them from believing when revelation comes down to them? Then they said, then it must be us. And Prophet ﷺ said, what prevents you from believing when I'm amongst you? Actually, the believers who have the most amazing faith are some people who will come after you. They will find pages that they will believe in. Those who will believe without seeing the Prophet ﷺ, without seeing his miracles, without being amongst him, they're the ones who will have amazing faith. And that gives some glad tidings to our generation, to those who come after us, that for us to believe in Allah and His Messenger, based on what we have read without seeing Him, this is in part an amazing faith. And I pray that Allah lets us live up to that special category which the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, has, to, has referred to us in. In, at the end of this verse, he said, And Allah has taken your covenant. Now, this covenant, according to Ibn Jarir, one of the major interpreters of the Quran, his tafsir is known as Tafsir at Tabari, he said that this refers to the covenant taken from humankind when they were in Adam, when Adam was created and all of the souls who were to be were extracted along with him. And, and Allah made a covenant with them. This is mentioned in Surah Al-A'raf. And Allah made all the souls bear witness that he was the Lord, and they all bore witness. So this represents the basis of the covenant between human beings and God. In what is referred to as the pre-creation. This is prior to our creation on the earth. That is, as human beings walking body and soul together. So our souls were already created. And this knowledge, of course, no one can remember having made this covenant, but it is imprinted on our souls. And it is the basis of our natural belief in God. And this is why Prophet Muhammad had said that every child is born with a natural belief in God. However, it is his parents, his environment, which causes him to swerve. So his parents will turn him into a Christian or a Jew or a Zoroastrian or whatever. The environment now affects him as he grows up. But this is the natural belief which each and every one is born with. We're born naturally as Muslims. So when a person finds Islam, chooses Islam, he in fact reaffirms that covenant which he made with God prior to appearing on this earth. It's a reaffirmation of the covenant with God. So Allah is also destining 
why we do not believe when that covenant is there. But it is within our nature to believe in him. Those who deny his existence deny it against what they know within themselves. Each person finds himself at different points in life where there is no one to turn to. And in those moments, his awareness or her awareness of God becomes very clear. They realize it. Then the moment passes and carry on. As Allah describes them on the people who are on boats or ships in the sea, when the, the sea becomes so rough, a storm overcomes them. The, sea, the boat is rocking as if it's going to turn over. Everybody's going to die. This time they call on their Lord. Everybody is calling on their Lord. Those who never call on him before, who claim they don't even believe in him. At this time, everybody's calling on the Lord. And then Allah takes it away from them, and they make it safely to the shore. And then they forget God. This is the nature of human beings that they do this. They're forgetful. So Allah reminds us here of this covenant that we made, which we should not allow to be forgotten when signs have come throughout our lives reminding us of that covenant. Then Allah goes on in the ninth verse to say, هو الذي ينزل على عبده آيات بينات ليخرجكم من الظلمات إلى النور وإن الله بكم لرؤوف رحيم It is he who sends down clear proofs to his servant that he may take you out of darkness into light Allah sends down clear proofs. Their proofs include the Book of Revelation, the Quran itself, as well as the miracles which took place in the time of the Prophet Muhammad Although those miracles were for the people of his time, these are the clear proofs. Because, of course, uh, people who would come after that time would not consider the miracles to be proofs to them because if somebody were to say prove to me that the prophet split the moon now, this is a, an incident which took place in the prophet's life when he was challenged by the pagans the Qurayshi pagans in Mecca to prove that he was a prophet to do some kind of miracle and he pointed to the moon they saw the moon split before their eyes this was a miracle. Now, that proof has no, imp no relevance to us in that we can't see it. Stories that people went to the moon and found the, the seam or the crack in the moon where it was split in half, these are all fables. Nobody has found any such crack. The point is that we read that and we believe it. Why? Because the information has come to us through authentic sources and we have already accepted the messenger we accept him based on the Quran the Quran that is the living proof that is the miracle which stands as a clear proof that he was a prophet of Allah as the Prophet Muhammad had said you know every prophet was given a message a, a miracle which would prove to the people to whom he was sent that he was in fact a prophet of God. Now they had a number of miracles, but each one would be given a particular miracle which would convince their people without the shadow of a doubt. And these miracles tended to be in the areas in which the people excelled, or certain elements of the people excelled, and they looked at in great awe or reverence or they admired etc so uh, prophet moses for example was sent to the people of egypt 
with Pharaoh, and um, their magic was greatly admired. The magicians held high posts in the government structure of Egypt. They were close to the Pharaoh himself. So Allah gave Prophet Moses a miracle which seemed to be in a similar category to the miracles of the magicians around Pharaoh. And that is why when Moses first threw down his staff before Pharaoh and his, the notables, his entourage, and it turned into a snake, they said, we have magicians who can do the same thing. You know, you're just one among them. In fact, if you gather them together, they can surely beat you. And this is where Moses challenged them to bring all the magicians together. But the miracle of Prophet Moses being in that area, from the outside, people looking at all of this, it seems like they're all doing the same thing. Magicians threw down their staves, it turned into snakes. Moses threw his down, it turned into a bigger snake, and his snake ended up their snakes. So the people on the outside, as Sarah concluded, Moses is just the biggest magician. He's actually probably, as the Pharaoh is quoted as saying in the Quran, you know, you're probably their teacher, you know, and your intention is to to take the people away from their religion, which is worshipping me as God. All right? This was the conclusion of Pharaoh. But for the magicians, they knew that Moses was a messenger of God. <laughs> then Allah goes on in the ninth verse to say, it is he who sends down clear proof to his servant that he may take out of darkness into light. Allah sends down clear proofs. The clear proofs include the Book of Revelation, the Quran itself, as well as the miracles which took place in the time of the Prophet Muhammad Although those miracles were for the people of his time, these are the clear proofs. Because, of course, uh, people who would come after that time would not consider the miracles to be proofs to them because if somebody were to say prove to me that the prophet split the moon now, this is a, an incident which took place in the prophet's life when he was challenged by the pagans the Qureshi pagans in Mecca to prove that he was a prophet to do some kind of miracle and he pointed to the moon and they saw the moon split before their eyes this was a miracle. Now, that proof has no, imp no relevance to us in that we can see it. Stories that people went to the moon and found the, the seam or the crack in the moon where it was split in half, these are all fables. Nobody has found any such crack. The point is that we read that and we believe it. Why? Because the information has come to us through authentic sources and we have already accepted the messenger we accept him based on the Quran Quran that is the living proof that is the miracle which stands as a clear proof that he was a prophet of Allah as the Prophet Muhammad said you know every prophet was given a message a, a miracle which would prove to the people to whom he was sent that he was in fact a prophet of God. Now they had a number of miracles, but each one would be given a particular miracle which would convince their people without the shadow of a doubt. And these miracles tended to be in the areas in which the people excelled, or certain elements among the people excelled, and they looked at great awe or reverence or they admired etc so uh, Moses for example was sent 
to the people of Egypt with the Pharaoh and um, their magic was greatly admired. The magicians held high posts in the governmental structure of Egypt. They were close to the Pharaoh himself. So Allah gave Prophet Moses a miracle which seemed to be in a similar category as the miracles of the magicians around Pharaoh. And that is why when Moses first threw down his staff before Pharaoh and his, the notables, his entourage, and it turned into a snake, they said, we have magicians who can do the same thing. You know, just one among them. In fact, if we gather them together, they can surely beat you. And this is where Moses challenged them to bring all the magicians together. But the miracle of Prophet Moses, being in that area, from outside, people looking at all of this, it seems like they're all doing the same thing. Magicians threw down their staves, it turned into snakes. Moses threw his down, it turned into a bigger snake, and his snake ate up their snakes. So people on the outside, as Pharaoh concluded, Moses is just the biggest magician. He's actually probably, as the Pharaoh is quoted as saying in the Quran, you know, you're probably their teacher, you know. And your intention is to try to take the people away from their religion, which is worshipping me as God. All right? This was the conclusion of Pharaoh. But for the magicians, they knew that Moses was a messenger of God. Because they knew that what they were doing were only illusions. Their staffs and sticks did not turn into sticks. It only appeared that way before the eyes of the people. But when Prophet Musa threw his, it became an actual snake. And it devoured theirs. They knew what he did was far beyond the powers they had. They were not able to change the nature of things. They only made things appear as illusions to people. Whereas Moses' staff actually became a snake. This is something only God can do. Change the nature of things. So they fell down in prostration. That was the proof. For the people who honored and looked up to the magicians when they saw him, them doing that, that, was, that should have been enough for them. Even if they could not grasp all aspects of it. But for Pharaoh, who of course was supposed, even when all the signs came to him, then he's going to find some excuse and a way out. Similarly, Prophet Jesus, he was sent to the Jews. The Jews were noted for their skills in medicine. They were able to heal the sick. They were able to provide medicines to treat you know, diseases of the eye, to mend broken limbs, and etc., etc. So Prophet Jesus, Isa, was given a series of miracles in their field, but beyond their abilities. So he caused the lame to walk, those who were born crippled. A broken leg, their legs were okay, it broke, and then you can speak. Put it back in place and put splints around it and it will heal properly but people who are born crippled born in with their legs their bones in such a way that there is no way to heal it he caused those people to get up and walk with their legs healed then he caused those who were blind to see this is something again the jewish doctors could not possibly do and went even further he caused the dead to come back person was already dead, ready for burial. He called the individual, who is recorded as Lazarus in the uh, Christian text. God alone knows if that actually was him and the incident exactly how it occurred. We don't know with absolute certainty. But anyway, it is mentioned there that he called this dead person back and the man got up and came to him. This is something obviously far beyond the skills of the Jewish doctors. But in spite of that, they rejected. But for the common people, seeing this was enough to convince them. Similarly, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was given, besides the personal individual miracles that were given to him to prove to those around him that he was a prophet of God, he was given a miracle which would be proof till the end of time because he was the of the prophets. There were no prophets to come after him. So Allah gave him a miracle to remain among people so that whatever generation was to come, they could always turn back and say, 
here is the proof that this man was a prophet of God. Now, the Arabs were very much into eloquence, into competitions for prose and poetry and things like this. They used to have gatherings in Taif, in Arabia, where leading orators and poets from all over the, the peninsula used to gather yearly, and they would have competitions. They would recite their poetry and their prose and so on and so forth. So Allah gave the Prophet ﷺ his miracle as a literary miracle. He made the Qur'an, the Word of God, he made it or revealed it in a linguistic, literary form which was inimitable. This is what he chose to do with the Qur'an. This is something he could have done with other messages. Just as he could have preserved the previous messages. But he didn't because there were always other prophets coming. So those messages were for limited periods of time. So the miracle, the literary miracle, was confined to the final message as was the principle of preservation. Because for it to have been a literary miracle, but Allah did not preserve it, didn't cause the Quran to be preserved, then that miracle would not have stood as a miracle to all peoples and all times. So these both factors had to be there. Allah protected the Quran. As Allah said, Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidhun. Indeed, I have revealed the reminder of the Quran and I will protect it. So he protected it from change. So the message remained pure. To all the generations, it has remained pure. But furthermore, that pure message, again, though it is an indicator of truth, without it being a miracle, it would not have also the impact of proof of the prophethood in the full sense. So Allah gave it this other quality of being a miracle in and of itself. And as such, it stands as clear proof of his prophethood. And no one in our time or any time to come can deny this. We will continue looking at the proof of the prophethood in our coming episode. I'd like to thank you for being with us in this segment of our series, Understanding the Quran. And I now bid you farewell. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.